Welcome back to Locked In. Guys, it's been like two weeks since I've been sitting here in the studio recording. We backed up a bunch of episodes and I had a couple weeks off. I actually just got back from Dallas, Texas, where I was filming a pilot to a new TV show we're working on. Really excited to share more details when the time comes. But anyways, on today's episode, we have Jeff Asher coming from Springfield, Massachusetts. Yes, another guest from Springfield. We all know you guys love that Chicky Chicky Telly episode. This perspective is a little bit different, though, because Jeff was a former Springfield police officer for 16 years until an incident in which he attacked a civilian during an arrest, gets him booted off the force and fired, and results in a prison sentence of nearly two years. Thank you guys for tuning in to this week's episode, and also a big, big thank you to Factor for coming back on and sponsoring today's episode for a second time. They were originally our first sponsor a few weeks back for the Chicky Chicky Telly episode, and they came back to sponsor today's episode. I've been eating Factor meals now for the last three weeks, and they are absolutely amazing. I got one right here. Look at this. Factor meals. You have to try this. They are so delicious, and they deliver delicious, fresh, never frozen meals that are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes. You could support our show by heading to factormeals.com slash locked in 50 and use code locked in 50 to get 50% off your order. Remember this box guys and grab your factor meal today. Jeff, welcome to the show. Another Springfield Mass guy. I don't know what is with all the Springfield Mass guys. I feel like in the last like three weeks, have all come out of the woodwork to it's come a, on the yeah, show. It's a popular city, you know. <laughs> and you, you're friends with Chicky, right? Yeah, I know Chicky very well. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I love that you time. guys are all like uh, close, or you guys talk to each other, and it, yeah. it's all interconnected. Yeah, for a bigger city. There's a lot of people that know each other. It's kind of a close city. Yeah, you know. And your story is just as crazy as Chicky's story. I mean, a cop for 16 years and, and all this going to jail on the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. So I'm really excited to dive into it today. Yeah. Let's start at the beginning. Where did you grow up? What's your childhood like? What, what's your family like? Uh, I grew up in Springfield, Mass. My father was a fireman in Springfield. He's been retired several years, but my mother worked for City Hall in Springfield. So another city worker and my brothers of school principal in Springfield. So we're all, you know, we're all employed by the city at one point, but it was a normal childhood, nothing crazy. Everybody worked. Um, my father helped run a bar downtown Springfield, Donnie's Cafe, which is a real popular bar. So we grew up in the bar. We got to know all the cops and all the firemen and all the politicians, the wise guys, they all <laughs> hung out there. Everybody hung out in the place. Um, but you know, it was kind of a normal childhood. You know, I was a C student. Um, and, uh, you know, just worked a lot of odd jobs, landscaping and stuff like that. But yeah, nothing, nothing crazy out of the ordinary. It was just you and your brother. It's just my brother and I, he's three years younger than me, my brother, Keith. Okay. Yeah. And how did you guys grow up? Like financially, was it lower, middle, upper class? It was kind of middle class. You know, they both, my father and mother both worked. Uh, he worked for the fire department, but we lived in apartments for several years and he was finally able to buy a house in Springfield back in. 1987, and that was about a year before I graduated high school. Who are you closer to, your mother or your father? Um, I don't know, that's a good question. Probably my father, um, you know, only because we were both in the military. A lot to talk about when it comes to, you know, our deployments, he's a Vietnam vet. Mm -hmm. So probably my father. Did, did you know at a young age that you wanted to go in the military because of your father, or you had no idea at that time? No idea at all. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I Did, mean, yeah, go on. No, I, I didn't know much back then because Vietnam vets aren't very open about Vietnam. That's not something they talk about. You know, every once in a while you run into a guy, I'll tell you a couple of stories, but most, most of the Vietnam vets aren't willing to kind of open up about what they experienced over there. My father was the same way. He had stuff in the basement, his DD-214, his medals, but I would just kind of look at him and he didn't want to talk about it. And you I'm know. sure you were curious. That probably spiked the curiosity. Absolutely. And he had, he never had a role in me joining the military or anything like that. It was This was all me. But 
Some of it was because my father had served. Did you have any aspirations as a kid at that age of what you wanted to do? Like I know as a kid, I've always had aspirations. We want to be a firefighter, a policeman, anything like that. What were I you wanted thinking? to be a firefighter. Okay. I wanted to follow in my father's footsteps and be a firefighter. And uh, the bar that my father worked at, Donnie's, was all cops and firefighters. But I will tell you, the cops that hung out there, bigger than life. This guy, Tiz, was 6'3", Italian cop, and I'd look up at him and see the gun, his revolver hanging off his, his gun belt, and just the sheer size of him, his gold chains. on Best guy in the world, Tiz. But he'd look up to those guys. But I still didn't want to be a cop. I just looked up to him because they were cops. I still had no clue what I wanted to do. More, more firefighting, I think, than anything. And middle school, high school, what kind of kid are you? Are you getting into trouble, or are you just you know, going through, like you said, you were a C student? Uh, anything exciting happen? No, I mean, it was kind of... You know, we get in fights and stuff like that, but it wasn't it wasn't crazy. I mean, I got along with everybody. You know, I got a mouth, so I love getting along with everybody. Um, all the different cliques, I could kind of talk and, and intermingle with everybody. So I never really had a problem going through school. I didn't get in much trouble. Little, little stuff yeah. heading into high school, little things, but nothing crazy. Yeah, you're very social. I, I I could tell that about you when you said, "Oh, I don't text. I like phone calls," and yeah. you know, we hit it off right off the bat. Yeah. It's always a good sign in a person when they're able yeah. to do that. Some people are the opposite and they're like, oh, I only text and they, and they can't respond yeah. well on the phone. So that's yeah. good. So high school's fine. When do you decide to, to uh, join the military? Did you go to college or did you go straight to the military? I did uh, one semester at uh, Stick. It's a community college in Springfield. I've never heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> STCC. It's, it's a small community college. I go there for, I think, three months. And I thought I was failing. I thought that my grades were horrible, and I'm like, what am I going to do? My parents take off to Washington, D.C. for a party, and I'm like, I'm joining the military. And I drove, Just like that. Just like that. I drove down to the federal building, and it's a, kind of a funny story. I walk into the federal building, and you've got the hallway with the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps. And as I'm going down the hallway, all these branches are – the Army guys are like, come on in. I'll show you a movie, and – you should join the army and the Navy guy the same way. Come take a seat, Air Force. I get to the Marine Corps door and I'm looking in, nobody's coming. So I'm like, all right, I'll walk in. I walk in, I see the dress blue poster. I see you know, all the different recruiting posters and all the history and I'm like, this is pretty cool, but nobody's talking to me. And this guy looks at me, he goes, come here. He brings me over, puts a VCR tape in, and he basically shows me what boot camp is going to be like and what it's like to be a Marine. I watched that and I signed up right there on the spot. Wow. Yeah. What year was this and how old are you? 1980, was it eight? 89. 1989, I, I walked right in, signed up, and I had to come back the next week and take the ASVAB. So I had to sign up for that. Uh, but once that was done, that was it. And you they, went right to boot camp. No, they gave me a date. I want to say that was in November. I left January 28th to go to Paris Island, just like that. My parents came home, and I said, hey, I joined the Marine Corps. My mother's like, oh, my God, you're going to go to war. And my father's like, there's no wars going on right now. But it, it was the best move I ever made. Got me away from Springfield, got me away. I, I always wanted to... I was a short guy with a chip on his shoulder, and the Marine Corps is where all those guys go. It gave you some structure, Absolutely. Too. Yep. Your dad was probably happy, too, to he follow was. his footsteps he a was. little bit. He was. He was absolutely. And he loved the Marine Corps, my father, growing up. We'd watch watching Sands of Iwo Jima. We'd watch Dirty Harry movies, or we'd watch <laughs> Marine Corps movies. He always looked up to the Marine Corps, even yeah. though he was in the Army. But uh, that's kind of what got me going in that direction. And you make it through boot camp, everything goes oh, according yeah. to plan. Yeah, no, yeah. How were, were you like in good shape at this period of time? Did you have to lose weight? What did you have um, to do? I probably had to lose 10 pounds. I had to get in running shape. So I was, I was in okay shape, but I had never really run before. So by the time I got to boot camp, I was at like maybe three miles. But they basically, they can mold guys that never ran before, never exercised before. And you're going to be in great shape when you leave. Yeah. Just it helped me out a little bit with my, my wind you know, going in like that. But, uh, you know, boot camp stuff. Paris Island was extremely hard. How do you think your friends would have described you at this time period back then? The ones that grew up with you, the ones that really knew you? I had a jokey. I was always like the class clown. I don't think anyone thought I was going into the Marines. 
And that's kind of why I did it. <laughs> They're like, Jeff would never go in the Marines. I go, yeah, I'm going down. I signed up for it. I'm going. I'm the same way. Like when someone says they don't think they're, I'm going to do something, I do the I opposite. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Plus, it's the hardest branch of the military. So I'm like, I'm gone. And it was the best decision I ever made to get away and go in the Marine Corps. Now, you ended up serving in a war, I think yeah. I was reading. Yeah, you weren't Storm. Ex- you weren't expecting to do that, were you? No, no. How does that, what, what happens? After boot camp, you get to your unit, you do your training, then you get to your unit. And um, I want to say it was within a, a year, 1990, is when Saddam rolled into Kuwait. And we got a call that we might get called up to go. We might, our unit may go over. Uh, and then about 30 days later, we got called up. And that was it. They brought us to Camp Lejeune. They had a bunch of training to get ready. A lot of it around gas masks and, you know, the nerve agents and the stuff we would deal with. Uh, And on New Year's Eve, 91, we landed uh, in Saudi Arabia. Totally unexpected. I never thought this would happen. But I was excited for it. You know, you don't know what's going to happen because at that point they were like, we're going to get, we're going to get gassed. Saddam's got you know, 300,000 Republican guards waiting for you. So we went over there, you know, really think we're going to mix it up with these guys. And did you? Well, when we first got there, the air war had just started. So we were back in this area called Manifa Bay, which was probably about 60 miles from the border. And uh, we'd watch the planes go over every day, and we watched the smoke come back every afternoon. So they'd hit the place in in the morning, and it would just roll back over us. And then they moved us up to the front, and that's where things started to get a little more interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend Joe and I were in a hole out in the desert that we had dug, and uh, he had the NVGs, night vision goggles. And he's looking out one night, and he starts to see little explosions and lights. And he's like, Jeff, there's something going on in front of us out here. So I said, all right, let me take a look. I looked, I said, all right, I see it, but I don't know what it is, could be our people. I run back, grab the gunny, and it turns out that 22 Iraqi tanks had rolled across the border and were headed right at us. Oh, wow. Our company, who by mistake was in front of the forward, uh, uh, the forward artillery unit. So we were kind of in a spot we shouldn't be. And in comes these tanks. So they start handing out law rockets and AT4s, so you could, but they're not gonna do much with the tank. I mean, basically, you're standing up facing a tank, taking a shot. We had no other support. Uh, but within minutes, the A-10 gunships came over, strafed them, destroyed, I want to say, 14 of the 22. And those turned around and hightailed it out. Was that like your first exposure to a near-violent scenario for you? It was. It, it actually got worse the next day. So after this happened, they told us they wanted us to come up to support that something had happened in front of us and they wanted us to come up there and help. Uh, and it turned out that eight Marines were killed in their uh, LAV. And uh, they were actually killed by our own people. So these A-10s that were shooting at the tanks shot one of our own vehicles and that we had eight dead Marines. Wow. So that was, I think, the first thing that really hit me over there. You know, for all the dead Iraqis you see in the burnt out tanks, seeing guys that were probably my age, a little older, a little younger, were laying there. And uh, we had to do litter duty and load these guys on trucks. And uh, that, that, was, that was pretty wild, especially at my age. That probably, th- th- thinking that it could have been you, it, or very well oh, yeah. could have been you. 19 years old, and I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking down like any of these guys could have been me. You know, and that was, you know, to this day, that's one of those things that I look back on while we were over. There was stuff that happened over there, but that was, I think, took a toll on me more than anything. Did that change your perspective of the military and why you were there when you saw that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you can watch all the war movies you want. You can think you know it, but when you experience it firsthand, when the artillery's coming in, uh, when you're being shelled, you know, when tanks are rolling towards you, and then when you end up seeing these bodies, it, t- it changes you forever. It changed me. I think that's the first time that when I got home, it started to feel a little different that the word PTSD started to become part of my vocabulary because I knew something was different when I came home. How long after that did you get to come home when that first incident happened? Uh, 
Uh, we stayed over there another eight months. So the war itself was done probably about three weeks later. You gotta remember, this thing only lasted maybe three days. You had the buildup, the air war. Then when we rolled over the berms and went in, you're talking three, four days. And uh, there was just too much firepower, too much American firepower. And most of the Iraqis that were on the Kuwaiti border weren't Republican Guard soldiers. They were uh, people that Saddam just sent out with guns. You're going out and you're defending our border. They weren't even soldiers. So they all gave up. They were either dead or they gave up to us. And then we would take them to the rear, question them, search them, put them on trucks, and they'd go back to Saudi. And eventually probably re return to Iraq. Did you get to talk to your dad at all about what you had seen and the experience and kind of share that with him? I did later on when I got home. You know, I had a lot of, a lot of pictures. We had the little disposable cameras, so I was able to take a lot of pictures. And I, I actually have a great picture on my phone of the LAV with a flag on it, which we took right after, you know, the Marines were taken where they needed to go. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, that, that was tough. Still is. Did know. he help you at all and work through it? you know, uh, mentally? No, my father's a great guy, but he's a man of few words. And I thought by bringing that up with him, it might, you know, make him nervy after what he had gone through. So I didn't really want to bring up much of what happened with me. I just wanted to kind of keep it inside, deal with it on my own. And, uh, you know, as I found out years later, that's not always the right thing to do. Not talk to somebody about it. You know? Absolutely. When you first had those initial thoughts of PTSD, did you go out and seek help at all? Uh, no, no, it, it took several years because, it, and I'm, we're going to get into this, but when I got on the police department, incidents started to happen. And what that does is it exacerbates the PTSD that I took from the military and it gets worse and worse and worse. And I didn't know a lot about PTSD then. I just started seeing changes in myself, the way I acted, uh, kind of a quick fuse. So these little things started to creep up and that's when you know something's off. Something's off. And I eventually ended up getting help and still am to this day. That's good. How long were you in the military for that? Did you serve in general for eight years, eight years? Yep. So you, that one, that one instance, when you first started experiencing that, that, that thoughts of PTSD, you still went back and, and continued on. Yeah. When eventually I went into the reserves and that was for the last couple of years, cause I was just getting onto the police department. So it worked out perfect. I only go one weekend every month to Plainville, Connecticut. And, you know, two weeks a year, they'd send us somewhere. Uh, but that was it. I mean, I was, I was pretty much done at that point. The last couple of years were easy. Uh, how, so how old would you have been? Like 26, 27 when you... Uh, oh, no, 20, 22, 23. When you were totally done? No, when I was totally done, 26. 26. Yeah. Yeah. What year do you join the police force? In 1993. And you're how old? 23? Yeah, 23 years old, yeah. Why did you decide you wanted to join the police force? Because you could have probably just lived off of the pension from the military at that point. Did you need the police force? Well, you don't get a full pension doing even eight years. You're really? not, not going to get anything, no. You no. served the country for eight years and they don't... No. That's a little insane. No. I mean, a, a pension would have been 500 a month, if that, 400 a month. So there's no money coming to you if you don't serve 20 years or more. You're not getting anything. Wow. But uh, I took the police test in 19... 90 right before i went to boot camp and i kind of forgot about it oh so it, you took it before oh, yeah wow. i took the fire and police test but i hadn't you know I, I forgot about it i came once i came home from desert storm i was working as a bouncer at a bar in springfield this bar called the keg room and uh, i went home one day and my brother said hey you got a, a letter from the city of springfield so i opened it up and it said uh we're looking for candidates to be police officers. You've passed the test. If you're interested, please come down to the police department and sign a sheet. So I go down and uh, I tell him I want the job. He says, oh yeah, you're number uh, 65 on the list. We're only hiring 35. So I said, okay. He says, if you were a veteran or a minority, you'd be all set. I said, I am a veteran. And he goes, you are? I said, yeah. He goes, drive to Boston tomorrow, get your name on the list and you're all set. So I had to drive all the way to Boston with my DD-214, put it on the counter, and the guy, dro it dropped me all the way to number six. All because you're a veteran. Yep, yep, so there was three cadets ahead of me, two veterans, and then myself. Interesting. So, yeah, so I became number six and uh, went right into the academy. Why Boston? That was just like the headquarters? Right, that's where the civil service headquarters is in the uh, 
you know, everything to do with all the testing that takes place all goes through Boston. Now, did you join the police force just because you felt like you had some background with the military or were you passionate about it? No, I wasn't passionate about it at all. I didn't want to be a cop. But I get that letter in the mail and I'm thinking, okay. You connect the dots. $58,000 a year. But this is back in the early 90s. $58,000 a year, another 10 in overtime. I'm like, plus I get a gun and a badge. I'm like, I'm in. That was it. I mean, it was like, it was just like me joining the military. I made the decision right then. Okay, I can be a cop. You know, if this guy can be a cop and that guy, I can be a cop. What did your parents think about you joining the police force at that point? I don't know. I mean, I don't, my mother never reacted to it. You know, I think my father would have rather I'd gone on the fire department in retrospect. I wish I had gone on the fire department, but um, I think it was the right decision at the time. Uh, the academy was fairly easy. Um, you had the military training. I had the military training. I was the president of my academy. Um, you know, the, the training itself was by a couple of old, kind of old school cops who were great guys, but they were kind of burnt out. So the training was super easy. Uh, the running we did was super easy. Um, and I ended up graduating. I think it was about three and a half months later I graduated from uh, the police academy and then went right into my shift. How hard is the training? for to become a police officer because something i see on social media is they they like you know how the city announces when someone gets sworn in right there's some very overweight officers out of shape that are, are getting through the academy and we had a nypd officer on the show and he was like that's like one of the most disturbing things having an overweight officer like make it through so is it is it was it not rigorous back then or is it not rigorous no there was a there was a guy that we knew that i mean he was He's like this. And what, they'd hang your pants. When you got fitted for your pants, they'd hang them in the roll call room. And we used to say you could put a phone book in his back pocket because his pants were so big. Uh, this guy couldn't run 10 feet without passing out. And he's, I believe, still on the job. How? I have no These idea. These are the people that are I know, protected. I know. Sir. It's awful. Wow. It's, and they're good guys. Don't get me wrong. No, I'm great, not, great. I'm not yeah. fat shaming them. Of Some of them not. are actually really good cops. Yeah. But um, there's really no, there should be a height, weight requirement. Some people are able to kind of slide through the system if you know people. You know? I think it's one thing to go in fit and then become maybe as you get sure. older in your career, that's different. That happens. It's aging, you know? Exactly. But to go in not at your prime, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's definitely yeah. strange to see. Our academy, I'm looking back on our academy because I would have retired two years ago or two days ago. Mm -hmm. um, would have been my full retirement. Uh, I look back on my academy. We were in pretty good shape, the guys. A lot of ex-military, um, you know, a lot of kids that I went to high school. But they were, nor you know, normal, height, weight, skinny guys, but no really big dudes. Uh, and everybody made it through. I think we only lost two people. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't for physical stuff. It was for mental stuff. They kind of broke down in the academy, and, and they just left on their own. Now, did you see a lot of uh, veterans joining the force at that time period? Yeah, there, there was quite a, quite a bit of them. I want to say in my class, we had about eight veterans that were in there. A couple guys that went to Desert Storm, not with me, but they were there when I was there. Um, some guys that already served in the Army and the Navy. Uh, they didn't go overseas like I did, but they were still, you know, they're still veterans. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had a much easier time in the academy because we already knew the paramilitary, you know, how, this, how the military works and how the police department's paramilitary the uniforms, the shining of the boots, the running. I think it was a lot easier for us. Some of the civilians are like, what? I got to fire a gun? You know, they never fired a gun. Yeah. And now they're giving them the, you know, they got to go to the shooting range and fire. They're nervous. What was harder, boot camp or police training? Oh, my God. Paris Island is, yeah. It's, it's the toughest training you're going to do in the military for a boot camp. Yeah. It's, it's Paris Island and then in the Coast Guard as the, actually as the second toughest training regiment. But... Uh, could you have stayed on in the military longer than the eight years if you wanted to? Oh, yeah. But I look back now and say I do. Do you wish that you did? Yeah, I don't think I'd ended up where I did yeah. if I'd stayed in the military. Where do you think you would have been? Like, do you ever think about the what ifs, like where you would be in the, in the military if you stayed? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably would have been gunny sergeant or over. Um, I probably would have been living, you know, on a base or near a base. Now, I, I would have gone to Afghanistan and Iraq after that if I had stayed in. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't live with regret. I made the choice at the time. I was kind of, 
I wanted to, at that point, I was just stepping into the, the police stuff. So I had, to, I had to let the military go. It was yeah. either that or the, and I made my choice. I said, all right, I'm going to be a cop. So you become a cop. What's day one like on the job? All right, day one, I'm working the four to 12 shift. Okay, so half the class goes four to 12, half the class goes midnight to eight, which is kind of where we all end up, the dog watch. Um, and I get in the car with this guy, CJ, who was a really good guy. And he just tells me, keep your fucking hands off the radio. Don't touch it. Keep your mouth shut. All the shit you learn in the academy, bullshit. None of it matters when you're out here. I'm like, okay, I'll keep my And later in the night, he let me use the radio. And actually, he was a great guy, but uh, we end up taking some regular calls that night. I make my first arrest. It's a warrant arrest. So there's really no creative writing. It's, you know, I arrested so-and-so. This is his address. This is the warrant number. And it, but that was my first arrest, so it was exciting, even though it was for a war and the guy didn't fight. It was kind of kind of easy, but uh, you know, as time went on, uh, you know, you start to see crazier stuff, crazier things start to happen. You're seeing the worst in people, so kind of that's when things kind of stepped up a little bit. Did you set like morals for yourself as an officer in those early days of what kind of cop you wanted to be, and not, maybe you saw other cops and say, "I never want to be like that individual too." Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted to be the cop that um, would give people breaks when there needed breaks to be given. I didn't want to be that guy who wrote everyone a ticket, who locked up everybody for a dime bag of weed. I wanted to be somebody that I felt when I was around the public that you know they would trust me, get to know me, uh, and respect me for doing stuff like that. Um, there were some cops that I saw early on that I knew right away, I don't want to be like him. I'm not saying they were brutal. It was just the personality. I don't want my personality to be like theirs. I want to be a different cop than they are. If we had like one of the officers that you're in training camp with here right now, what would they say about you from that early time period? How would they describe you? I think they'd describe me as a, as a go-getter. Um, you know, like I told you, I was the president of my class. Uh, I got along with everybody in there for the most part. Uh, I didn't beef with anybody. Um, you know, they, like I said, they, I think they trusted me when we were in the academy, and we built a we built a bond in there. So I think they respond fairly well. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody'd be able to tell you what they what happened to me. You know, eighteen years later, but yeah, they they no one could predict that. No one could predict it, right? What's the town like? The city like? Is it crime heavy? Is there violence? What's a? I know there's like a lot of mob activity, but is it like violent mob activity? There's a lot of stuff goes on in Springfield. So we, back when I came in in 93, the North End, which is your Hispanic area, was the Latin Kings and the Los Salitos. The Los Salitos, or the, uh, they were out of Hartford also, the Los Salitos. Uh, the Winchester Square area was predominantly black gangs. That's where they all kind of hung out and did their stuff. But uh, it was, it was very, a lot of shootings. Um, our murder rates always hovered around 20, 18, 20, 22. It's never really deviated, although this year uh, we're heading for a much higher rate. Right now. How does that compare to like some of these other big cities? Per capita, about eight years ago, Springfield was ranked the top 10 most violent city in the nation. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah. what about when it's you were matters. serving as an officer? I don't know if we were there then. I just remember that article probably around the time I was leaving the department. But to me, it was there were sections of Springfield you had to be very concerned when you got out of your car. And what happens when there's a death in the police force? Like what, what are the other officers doing? What are you guys doing to support? And how does the city react when something like that happens? They all come together. I mean, I've been to some police funerals that uh, have been pretty, pretty emotional. You know, the bagpipes start playing um, and uh, march, you know, you start a march right out to the cemetery. It's, it's emotional. That's when you see the thin blue line come together. I would say this, anytime there's a funeral, Cops really come together and support each other. It's uh, the community was great. Um, so it's yeah, it, it's a very tight knit group of people getting together when something like that happens. And were you close with the officers on the force and in your department? Like you personally, do you guys hang out? Um, do you yeah. see each other? Yeah, I mean, I my partner. So you end up teamed up with two other guys. They have an A group, a B group, and a C group, and you rotate through the car. So you work with one of your partners for two nights and then the other one for two and then they work together for two. Uh, but I was very close to my partners. You know, plus once you start to go through things with them, uh, 
you know, fights and it's kind of stressful stuff that you form a bond. And I think that's what happened with us. We, you know, some of our partners, we formed a tight bond over that. And what kind of violence did, what did you see directly happen to you during your career, maybe early on or in the middle of it? In 95, I end up getting paired up with this cop. And uh, I had already heard some rumors about this guy, that he had fired a gun at somebody in the woods, said he saw a shiny object, and that he tried to clean his gun with aqua velva to hide the fact that he shot it. That's the first story that I heard about him. And then the incident I was involved with him was we were driving down the street called Locust Street, and there's this Red Lion Bar, very seedy place. And as we're driving up, he tells me, grab this guy out on the sidewalk quick. I want to talk to him. So I wave the guy down. He comes over to the car. While he's at the car, I ask him, hey, you got your ID on you? Where are you from? What's your name? Next thing I know, bang. I get clipped in the face. Sucker shots me. So I grab him, and I'm holding him like this. I'm trying to choke him. I'm pulling him into the cruiser. I'm starting to hit him. He gets out, runs around the car, grabs him, starts to pull him off. I jump out. And as soon as I jump out, he wriggles himself loose from, from my partner, points a gun at my face, fires three times, a little 38 caliber uh, Rossi revolver. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, I didn't even have time to react. Three shots, and he, I didn't know if I was hit or not. I wasn't, but I didn't know. You just, the three shots go off, and I was, I called for help on the radio, shots fired, and you could, and Springfield's a bigger city, you could hear the cruisers already. As soon as you hit that button, they're coming. I mean, you know, 20, 30 cruisers are coming with guys that are ready to help. Um, the guy ended up blowing his own kneecap off on the ground. He kept firing the gun underneath him. And uh, it was a great arrest. I mean, this, this guy had heroin in one pocket, crack in the other. His windbreaker was filled with extra shells for his gun. He was wanted out of New Jersey. And... Uh, and then he shot himself on the ground. How does he miss you if he points a gun at I your face? I have no clue. Were you ducking at all or were you, no, did it, you freeze? But it's just when I got out of the car. So okay. it was still kind of moving and he's like, boom, boom, boom. And I could hear it. I could just hear the cracks of the gun. And I'm like, I think he missed. I think he missed me. And he did. And then, the, you know, then it was, we jumped on him, got on the ground and you heard another shot. Yeah. And that's when I heard him scream. Did that trigger any PTSD at all in that moment? It did after. It did have, not at that moment. I mean, at that moment, my, you know, I was about as amped up as could be. So no, it didn't, it didn't bother me then. But uh, later that night, when I got back to the station, I noticed something and it's, it sticks with me to this day because it wasn't just this incident, but no one asked me at the station how I was doing. Now one person, you need to talk to somebody, how you feeling? Nobody said a word. I ran out to a payphone at the time. They had the payphone out, out front, and I called my wife, and I said, I was just almost killed. She said, what happened? So I told her the story. She says, well, come home when you can. And I said, I think I'm going to go out and grab a drink. So my father was still bartending at that bar downtown. And I said, I think I'm just going to go down and have one drink to kind of ease it, and then I'll be home. But nobody ever asked me. There was no, And there's still to this day that they're still not where they need to be for cops with PTSD. They're just not there yet. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. Um, I mean, the, my read of it was always, if you're a cop, you don't cry about, this is our job. You're not, we don't want to hear that something upset you. You're supposed to have that tough guy mentality. Go have a drink, go home, forget about it. We'll see you next shift. Nobody ever really cared when you got involved in anything crazy. Every once in a while, somebody would come up and your partner, hey, you're doing good, you're doing good. But I never saw anything from the administration where they came to you and said, hey, are you doing okay after that incident? Or are you doing okay after this accident? Or, you know, because it happened. A lot of stuff happens over the course of the career. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the stress gets worse and worse and worse as you go on. And uh, we don't really don't have an outlet for it. Did you harbor any resentment towards the force after that instance? When you, when you were thinking everything? Oh yeah, that stayed in the back of my mind. And uh, come to find out about a year later that the cop, well, I'll, I'll tell you ended up what happened. So after this incident, I get called down to the DA's office and he sits me down and he plays me yelling for help. And he says, you remember this night? And I said, well, yeah, it was just a few weeks ago, it was awful. And he says, uh, tell me what happened. 
So I told him the story I just told you. And he looks at me and he goes, I can't put you on the stand. And I said, did I do something wrong? He goes, no. He goes, you read your partner's report that night? And I said, no. And he goes, read it. This cop was one of these cops that he wanted that hero complex. So he, want, he did creative writing. He wanted everything to be about him. So I'm the one who got shot at. He turns it into, he's the one who got shot at, but the guy pointed the gun at me. So they had to plea this guy down for this because he lied on the report. And the DA was smart enough to say, Jeff, I, I'm not going to put you on the stand to lie. So instead of getting 18, 20 years or more, he ended up serving 12, and then he was turned over to Jersey to serve his warrants down there. What happened to the cop? Uh, I'll get to that in a second, because okay. it, it's important, I tell you. After that incident, I worked with another guy who was one of my favorite partners, this kid, Brendan. And uh, he says, Jeff, you should have known this years ago. He said, I was out one night with this cop, and he said, uh, we get in a stolen car chase. We chase the car into a driveway in the Mason Square area. And he says, the guy gets out, runs. Brock gets out to chase him. And he said, I go check out the stolen car quick, make sure there's not a second person in it. And he says, they get out in the woods and Brendan hears two shots, boom, boom. So this guy we're talking about comes out of the woods with the guy and he hands him to Brendan and Brendan walks him back to the car. The guy looks right at Brendan and he goes, listen, he goes, that car out there, it's stolen. And he says, in those two bags of weed I got in there, contractor bags with the stem sticking out the bag, he goes, that's mine too. And he says, I got two warrants. And he says, and that gun, that's mine too. And it's not registered to me. He basically fessed everything. And then he goes, he tackled me. He grabbed the gun out of my waistband. He fired it twice in the air out there. And now he's saying, I shot at him. And, and Brendan said, I believe the guy. I mean, he can't do anything about it because he wasn't there, but he knew that this kid was telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. That's so crazy. But that's that hero mentality. Just like I didn't get shot at, he got shot at. He did that his whole career, this guy. And he left because somebody put a picture of his face on a donkey and put it up all over the police department. He sued the police department, walked away with, I think, I think three or 400,000 in his full pension. For that? For that. And that's a cop that never should have even gotten that to nope. begin with. Nope. That's like a flaw in the, the stress, system. Wow. The stress is killing me and the, every one of the departments have to get me and you know, there's a picture of me as a jackass with my face on it. He sued, won, and retired and left. How did you feel about cops like that? Because I'm sure you encountered a lot Awful. in 16 years. Oh, yeah, hmm. yeah. I mean, those are the guys you don't want to be around. And we didn't have a ton of those guys. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's 500 guys in our job. There were probably maybe 10, 12 guys you didn't want to be around. Um, you know, there were cops that were better than other cops, cops that were smarter than other cops, uh, more street savvy. But, you know, it was, it was a good crew of guys. There were only a, a handful that you questioned where they're coming from. Yeah. You know, whether it be racists, whether it be, you know, homophobic, whether it be, uh, you know, are they brutal? Are they, are they just going after people, targeting people? There was a couple of those guys where you thought it could be true with, this, with these guys. Were you ever put in scenarios where you were with those guys, serving behind them, with them, and you know, your moral compass is at stake and you have to make a decision to have their back or walk away from it in those? Yeah, there, there was one guy and he was the nicest guy in the world. He was, I mean, he's just a great cop, but uh, he had a drug problem. And we walked into an apartment in the north end of Springfield and uh, we found a large amount of, of drugs. And uh, I watched him throw the drugs out the window. They fall down into these bushes three stories below like, what did I just see? And then he says, I'll be right back. And then he goes down and I see him circle in front of the window and pick him up and put him in his pockets. And I'm like, did I just see that? He's a great guy. And you know, the department during training would always say, if you see a cop doing something bad, you report it. I suppose that's depending on what you do. I'm not a snitch. I'm going to make sure that I'm taking care of that. This isn't going to jam me up at all. But there were no arrests. It was in a vacant apartment. All the kids, we, we ended up booting them out of the apartment, all these gang members. 
They had the stuff hidden behind an old radiator. So it's not coming back to anybody. You think any of these kids are going to say, yo, he took my drugs. They're not going to say it. They just left. They're, they caught a break. But he took the stuff. And he lost his job years later. And again, he was a great cop. Yeah. He just had a, pro he had a problem with drugs. And it, it caught up with him on the job. And did you see a lot of that happen in those situations? Not a ton. Um, you know, there were little things I saw here and there. A lot of it focused on more the use of force than it did drugs. So there were times I saw guys go overboard uh, and do things. And uh, the ones that would piss me off are the guys that show up to your chase or your call where you chase somebody and they come flying while the guy's cuffed and they tag him. And then I'm looking at him like, hey, I got to bring this guy in. You just roll up and smack the guy in the face because you drove here at 80 miles an hour and you're all pumped up. Then you hit my prisoner. Guys would do that. Why? What, what's the logic behind that for them? Is it an ego thing? A, a power a, trip? Ego, adrenaline, uh, kind of a, a fuck you to, to, you know, to the bad guy. Like, I had to drive here at 80 miles an hour. I'm the one who caught him. I'm the one who has to walk him on the camera in five minutes. And you walk into the woods and you smack this guy as hard as you can in the face, drag him out, rip his clothes. Now when I get in, that's how he's going to look. He's going to have a hand mark on his face. And, uh, you know, he's my responsibility, this guy. That, that happened a lot. And when that happens, are you standing up for this uh, prisoner? Or are you saying, hey, don't do that? Like, are you... Well, I, would, I, I wouldn't do it right there. I'd grab the guy later in the garage and tell him, don't ever do that to my prisoner again. If I got a right on this, if my ass is on the line, we're going to have a talk. But don't ever do that again. And, you know, but it did. It happened once in a while. Now, if something was getting too far taken, uh, uh, carried away, would you have stopped it? Oh, sure. Absolutely. So you knew the difference between right and wrong. At, Absolutely. In, in yeah. that sense. As it turns out, I was involved in a lot of incidents, you know, later on in my career. But yes, I, I definitely would stop it if I saw it going too far. Now, throughout your career, like if we were to look at your file, what's it like? Like, is there a... Thick. You, it's thick? Thick. And when you say thick, what do you mean by that? My IIU file is very thick. What's an IIU file? Internal investigations. So you were involved, roped in a lot of things? A lot of stuff. When Factor jumped on board to sponsor our podcast, they sent me a box filled with assorted smoothies and chef choice meals. My production team absolutely loved the smoothies and I enjoyed the meals so much that I've been spending my own money to order meals. So far, I've tried the jalapeno lime cheddar chicken, spicy sweet potatoes and peanut sauce, turkey chili and zucchini, and the garlic and herb chicken breast. This July, get Factor, America's number one ready to eat meal kit and enjoy eating well without the hassle. You choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash lockedin50 and use code lockedin50 to get 50% off your order. As you guys know, I'm super dialed into my fitness, usually working out twice a day between weight training and boxing. Post-workout meals are so important, and by choosing to order my post-out my post-workout meals through Factor, I could treat myself to 34-plus weekly restaurant quality options like bruschetta shrimp risotto, green goddess chicken, and grilled steakhouse filet mignon, ready in just two minutes. This podcast is everything to me. It's on my mind every day, and I'm constantly working on it and perfecting my craft. Some days I'm so dialed into my work that I don't always find the time to hit the grocery store. With Factor, I'm able to skip the trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning, all while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality I need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all I have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back into growing the podcast. Head to factormeals.com slash locked in 50 and use code locked in 50 to get 50% off my order. That's code locked in 50 at factormeals.com slash locked in 50 to get 50% off your order. Because you did it or people accused you or what would happen? Well, <clears throat> I'll start off with what turned out to be the main reason that I ended up in jail. Okay. So in 1997, there was a house in uh, this Mason Square area, the one that I told you is kind of a hot spot. Um, and, uh, we get a special, what's called a special attention. So one of the police commissioners lived on this street and said, hey, at the corner of Quincy and Orleans, his house, they're dealing crack all night. There's gang members out there. You got to do something. So she goes to my captain and she says, 
I want a special attention on this house. Who works the district car? Oh, it's Asher and his buddy Mickey. So, all right. So we go up there, knock on the door. They, it was, wasn't a raid now, but eight of us went there and some dope lets us in. When we go in, we find a ton of fake drugs. They were cutting up soap and they were selling soap as fake crack to all the white kids that come from the suburbs in Vermont. You know, these kids don't realize they're smoking soap until they get halfway up 91, right? Going yeah. back to Greenfield or whatever. So we go in, the tub is filled with feces and urine. The house stunk. You got the fake drugs. We're kicking people out. And I get a guy outside and uh, I say, what's your name? He says, Roy Dancy. I said, let me search it quick. Big knife on him. Take the knife off him, run him for warrants. Nothing comes back. I let him go. So that night I get into the uh, police department. I pull in my cruiser and this guy comes up to me. He goes, hey, Jeff, I used to work at the jail. He says, uh, what name did he give you last night? And I said, Roy Dancy. He goes, that's not Roy Dancy. That's Roy Parker. He says, let's go run him now. Five warrants. All types of crazy shit. So the next day I get a rookie female partner assigned to me. But I'm going to get this guy now, right? And again, the police commissioner that's on this civilian review board asks me to, they signed to go to this house. Yeah. So we get there and his wife and him were on the, it's Janet Dancy and Roy Parker, they're sitting right on the front porch. And I said, hey, come here for a minute. I want to talk to you, Roy. She comes running down the sidewalk. Get the fuck out of here. You ain't talking to me. He ain't talking to Roy. And she takes a swing at my female partner. So as soon as that happens, I reach around, grab her arm, click, click, cuffs, and I throw her right in the cruiser. And as soon as I do, I turn around, I see an arm, and I get slashed with a piece of metal with glass on it across my neck. Holy shit. And I'm now there's, there's blood everywhere, and I start having this mini war with this guy in the street. And he's a tough guy. He's been locked up 260 times. And that was before this incident. 260. 260 times. I almost brought his bop here today to roll it out on the floor. It would go past him all the way to the wall. All the way to the wall. So he cuts me. We get in this giant fight. We get down the street. I call for help. And uh, the first cop gets there, pulls up. He goes to grab him. He gets cut with the metal, cuts his hands all the way, both of them, ripped them open. Another car pulls up. We finally get the guy down on the ground and he still won't give us his hands. So I boot him right in his shoulder as hard as I could. As soon as I did that, the arm come up, cuffs go on, a lieutenant on scene grabs the metal to tag it, and then I go to the ambulance. Um, and as I found out later on, he was HIV positive. It was actually full-blown AIDS at the time, and I had the blood all over me, so I was nervous over that. Um, and about three days later, I found out that it was filmed by an amateur a civilian with an old camcorder, the ones with the VCR tapes in it. That beeps the red, uh, but yeah. Exactly. And all you could see was us over him. This is right after this battle with the guy, us over him. You see me do this, you see him roll, and you see us pick him up. All of a sudden I get suspended for five days and the story hits the media. White cop kicks black, black suspect in head. I'm like, I didn't kick him in the head. I kicked him in the shoulder. He cut my neck open. Like that's, I could have shot the guy. I didn't, but I could have. And it just turns into this media firestorm. The next thing I know, it's the news in LA. All over the country, they were playing this clip and they were comparing it to Rodney King. And I was getting calls from, from everyone. And I'm like, what am I gonna do? I didn't do this. I mean, I did it, I kicked him. He cut my neck open, he had five warrants, he's a, he's a bad dude. Well, the news, once the news gets your name, they can write whatever they want. So it was all premised around the fact that I was white, he was black, even though there was no racial component to this thing at all. This is just a bad guy with a warrant who happens to be black and I happen to be a white cop. Um, and this went on for almost a year where I wasn't, I was suspended without pay. Um, I almost lost my house, you know, I very well could have been divorced, although my wife stayed by my side through a lot of stuff. She wasn't that, it was just the stress that it brought on the family. Um, and this was before I had kids, so it was just the two of us. What year, what time frame? 1997. 1997. 1997, And yeah. you're not even 30 yet. Not even 30. 
So I'm seeing all the news coverage, and it got worse each week. It, it, this, they said that uh, I was the judge, jury, and executioner. And I'm looking at my lawyer like, executioner? The guy got five stitches on his head. His shoulder's not even hurt from where I kicked him. I said, I'm hurting more than he is on my neck. Didn't matter. The news just kept in, inflating. They love to do that. They love to take uh, stuff like this and make it into something bigger than it was. Um, in retrospect, that night ruined the rest of my career. Because they would use that against you later. Everything on. I did after that, every time my name came up, every time I arrested somebody that complained, he was part of the Roy Parker thing. And they'd build this kind of, uh, they'd build this personality, like this guy's a brutal cop. Look at him. Look at him with the tattoos. Uh, the, you know, he looks like he's, uh, he's Aryan with his shaved head. He must be beating people. Not, but here's what ended up happening. We get to court. And during the hearing, he admits on the stand, Roy Parker, that he did not kick him in the head. After a year. He admits it because the nurse at the jail, at Ludlow Jail, said, hey, when he came in, he said he got hit with a small billy stick in the head. And the cop kicked him in the shoulder. But it was a year before all that stuff came out. And at the bindover hearing, the judge during a break, or actually coming back from a break, had a TV brought in, put a VCR tape in. They had slowed the tape down, and they circled the metal weapon underneath. Because it was this thing about, did he still have the weapon on him when you kicked him? Was it there? They circled it, and then within an hour, I walked out of there with it all over. Did they charge you criminally, or was it just no, a civil suit? They would have if this, this went forward. Hmm. Uh, he sued the department, but that happens all the time. We get sued all the time. Um, How did we, it make you feel, like this whole thing, that the department maybe didn't even have your back at this point? Oh, they didn't. And let me tell you, it got worse. They made me go to sensitivity training, uh, basically kind of admitting that there's some racial component to it. You need to... Uh, read this book about slavery, and you need to read this other one about how to deal with people that are Vietnamese. I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm like, I was right. I did the right thing. But because the newspaper for so long destroyed my name, there was almost no coming back from this. Uh, and it took a little while to get back to, to work. I mean, I, I ended up back at work probably three months later, and it was hard. It was hard transitioning back to work. It made me think about everything I did the rest of my career. Did you ever find yourself taking that anger out on other arrests, like as time would go on because of the frustration with the department cutting corners, anything, or were you just no, a straight and arrow I, cop? I, listen, I made mistakes on that job. Mm -hmm. None of them are the stuff that have been in the newspaper. I've made some mistakes. Uh, I've yelled when I shouldn't have. I've probably gone too far a few times when I shouldn't have. Uh, nothing criminal, nothing like that, but I made bad decisions, as all cops do. We all do. We all look back and say, geez, that night I shouldn't have been that. I was too hard on this kid. And, um, but nothing that I went through was, was like that. These were all uh, really bad guys that did not want to cooperate with the police, and I had to use force. And my name, being attached to it, made it even bigger than it was. So on the times that you, it was right that you had to use force and you genuinely knew you had to, but they were a different skin color. Were you hesitant at that point because of this past incident? It's always in the back of my mind. Yeah. And, and they would still put me in areas where there were African Americans, there were, there were uh, Puerto Rican, and it, that's not what policing is about. I'm not out there to, I don't look at people. It's, it had nothing to do with skin color. This has to do with, hey, you give me a dispatch call to go here, I'm gonna go there. Whoever I deal with, so I deal with. If they've done something bad, they're going to go to jail. It, it doesn't matter. Nope. So if it was a white guy, you would have done the same thing. Would have thing. done the same thing. Yeah. Would have done the same thing. How are your colleagues treating you when you came back after that leave? They were actually great. I got a lot of support from the street cops. Um, a lot of supervisors stuck by me. Um, some of them kind of, you know, they put themselves on the line, so a couple of these bosses, by having my back. Um, because they knew it could mess with their career, their promotions. But uh, I got a lot of support because of that. Yeah. But my reputation in the city as a cop, my reputation at the courthouse as a cop, all went like this. And I thought I could survive it. I said, if I just go back and, you know, just be myself and keep working, this will all work out. But uh, it didn't happen that way. Do you wish you could, if you could go back in time that you could leave after that yeah, incident? I would have resigned after that. My father-in-law and, uh, and my parents both said, you know, maybe it's time to leave, go do something else, lateral transfer to the fire department, whatever. 
But uh, in the back of my mind, I always thought I could survive that incident. And uh, it didn't happen. Actually, things got a lot worse. You know, something I've always been interested about is like when the city will publicize an individual for all the good they do. And then the second that something goes wrong, it's over and there's no coming back. And I look at my situation with that because they used to write good articles about yeah. me and then, then something happens that they don't even know the full story to. It's it, it's well, over. You're done. Yeah, you're, you're done. done. That's like, it's, I strongly believe in like, you're guilty the second you're arrested. Oh yeah. There's no fair trial, there's nothing. None. And, my, and my, my chief at the time, early on in that incident where I had to kick the guy in the shoulder, she said after one week, this is my chief, I wouldn't want to see a dog get kicked like that. I'm looking like, that's a, she hasn't talked to me. She hasn't talked to anybody involved. Now the chief's hanging me out to dry. As soon as she said that, then the general public says, oh, the chief thinks the dog shouldn't be kicked like that. He must be wrong. Mm. So I'm already screwed. Now back then it wasn't common for a woman to be a, a, a police chief, was it? No, she's the first in our city's history. Wow. Yeah. And how, what was the relationship with the cops, male cops and her being the chief? It was very good at first. I think a lot of these guys supported her, including myself. Um, there were a couple loose family connections. She knew my wife's aunt and Irish music. This is some, so I thought, oh, this is going to be great. You know, she's chief. And uh, not that I was going to get taken care of, but I'm like, it's a fresh start. We'll see what happens. And uh, this happened within a year. And uh, you know, she stabbed me right in the back. Wow. No shame. You probably didn't look at her the same way again. Ever. Ever. She asked me to quit several times during that before my trial. Please quit for the department. And I just laugh at her across the desk. I'm like, you've got some nerve asking me to quit. I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong. You know I didn't do anything wrong. You went to the newspapers and said I did anything right at the beginning of this. You hung me out to dry. It's for the best, Jeff. I'm so nervous about you. I care about you. And I, used to, I just got up from the chair. I'm like, I, I'm not listening to this nonsense. I'm not doing it. And she hated me all the way to she left. You know, uh, so you go back to the department, you make it like another 10 years by this point, another decade you go okay. through. Yeah. What's, what happens that ends it all, that ends your career with the Springfield Police Department? I would just say there's one incident that happens before the incident that ended. So okay. uh, car parked at a gas pump. What uh, year is this? 1990, maybe? You're talking to us. Probably in the early 2000s. So pretty close to the first situation. Yeah, maybe about five years after that. Okay. So things have gone fairly well. I mean, you're always going to get complaints, but nothing that was high profile or, or anything like that. Um, there's a car parked at a gas station. It's all fogged up. It's been there an hour and a half. The gas pump is off the car and under the car with a, with a circle of gas under it. So, uh, the clerk says, hey. This guy's been here two hours. I've been banging on the windows. I'm worried about this gas pump. Is this guy suicidal because the gas pump's out? You couldn't see because the fog and the tint both. All you could see was kind of a shadow in the driver's seat. And he was thrashing. Boom, boom. You saw the wheel on the car shaking. So we call for a boss. And at some point, we make the determination. We got to take these windows out and find out what's going on in there. Is it a medical emergency or whatever? So we smash both windows out. One of the guys I'm with opens up the passenger door. The guy's fighting with him. Now he's swinging. He pulls him out through the passenger door onto the ground. This, this guy's a big dude. We're rolling around with him. I mace him. We handcuff him, get him in the ambulance, and the guy calmed down almost instantaneously. He said, I'm a diabetic, and I pulled in here to grab some food. I didn't feel right, and I've been here for a while. So we're like, all right. I go, do you, you realize you just fought with us? No, I'm sorry, man. I, when I have a seizure, I have no idea what's going on. And he had some injuries. He had glass stuck in his head from being brought out into the cement when he was fighting with us. No other significant injuries. This was it. I mean, besides having mace in his eyes, that was it. We get to the hospital. The doctor confirms that uh, he's a diabetic. And he apologizes to us. And the, I said to the supervisor, should we lock him up? I mean, he fought with us. Shouldn't we cover ourselves? I get it, he's a diabetic, but no, no, he's good. We're gonna let it go. Five days later, the Nation of Islam in Springfield, Mass, wanted my head. Because my name was on the report. Even though I only maced him, I never actually physically touched this guy. But all of a sudden it started. 
And there were newsletters and, and news articles saying that I was a member of the Blue Klux Klan, um, which is, you know, organization of racist cops, no. which uh, is, you know, I, I'd never heard of that in my life. I have no clue what they're talking about. But it was, we beat him, we dragged him out the car window. He never came out the car window. He came out the door. But that was, it was all inflated. Somebody that was in a window up top claims we stomped on his head for 10 minutes. This guy had no injuries to his head, but a couple glass punctures. But these are people that, you know, they're not friends, friends of the cops. So they're going to they're gonna help. They went, probably went down there and looked for witnesses and got people to just say, hey, the cops didn't sound wrong. But um, that incident there was another big one. So now my name is rolling in the newspaper again. The cop from the Parker incident, who ki still kicked the guy You're in, in the all head. these big incidents, yeah. Here he is again. And uh, I got through that. Um, the mayor at that time was another one who didn't support us, wanted immediate suspensions across the board. Um, and uh, it didn't happen this time. We actually went to a commission hearing and were found to have done nothing wrong. It turns out this guy had a history of fighting with people at UMass um, as a student, fighting with paramedics during these diabetic seizures. He was a big time steroid user and he couldn't control his rage and um, he would attack uh, EMTs and cops all the time. And he since died uh, because of that. He overdosed and died. Wow. Yeah. The same with Roy Parker, the first guy. Left. He died too. He's dead too. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's crazy, like all these incidents that happen among your journey, and there's a lot of opportunity for you to leave the department too. What do you think kept you to stay? Why do you want to stay? Was it back to like that early childhood thoughts of, you know, they're saying one thing and you're doing the opposite? Yeah, I mean, the department is, is trying to push me out. Even though I hadn't done anything wrong, I, I, I don't feel like I did anything wrong. I know the cops with me didn't feel like I did anything wrong, but. And I'm just like, I'm gonna stand up to this. I didn't do anything wrong, I'm staying. I'm staying, it wasn't a good idea, probably, but I'm not gonna let them be the reason that I leave being a cop, yeah. you know? Um, they don't have to support me, but here's two times in a row where I was found not to have done anything wrong. And now I'm back to work again. And you make it through another saga yeah. incident. Yep. And a third one happens, a third major one. Yeah, that one was in 2000, what are we talking here? 2009, uh, traffic stop. And uh, it wasn't my traffic stop. So we went out on this gang patrol. It was two cops in one car and a boss and another cop in another. And we just drive around looking for stuff in the same neighborhood. They called us, they said, we need an assist with a car that's pulled over. So we pull up. And the boss on scene, the lieutenant says, Jeff, can you talk to the, uh, the driver, the female? We're gonna get this guy out of the car. I go over to talk to her. She's very nervous. I said, you doing all right? What's going on? I don't have a license. And uh, she didn't even get, I think she got about five words in. I heard a fight going on. So now this guy's swinging at the lieutenant, swinging at the other cop, and he's running. So we catch up to him back at our cruiser. And within a couple of minutes of fighting this guy in the car, He's a tough kid and he's been in jail for a long time. He just got out. He doesn't want to go back. During the fight, I hear my partner yell, he's got my gun, he's trying to pull the gun out of my holster, smash him. So going through my mind, that gun comes out, we're dead. Or somebody's getting shot or somebody's getting injured. But you know, there's a gun involved. So I immediately started to hit him with my flashlight. The quickest thing I could get to, I hit him probably six or seven times, and I miss him probably 11 times. And there's four cops at the scene. Four cops there, yeah. And you guys are at the hood of a car? Hood of a car. So he's prone over the car, but he's fighting. He's you know resisting. This isn't your simple, he just won't give you the arm. He's actively fighting. So four cops couldn't restrain him, though, by that point? Or? Yeah, it was, he was over the car, but he's, he's kind of sliding back and forth. He's kicking at us. You have to get his arms. Is he a big guy? Or? Yeah, yeah, he's a big dude. He's a big dude. He's been around the block a few times. Mm -hmm. But you got to remember, this all happened within minutes. So yeah. it wasn't like we were fighting him for 15 minutes and we couldn't get control of him. It was three or four minutes. So I finally connect with him good right here. Um, after the fact, he ended up with missing teeth and broken orbital mm -hmm. bone. Um, but uh, we get him to the ground. He's still fighting. So I hit him one more time in the back of his calf. As soon as I did that, the arms come out. We ended up getting a medical attention at the hospital. We find drugs in his pocket um, and 
course, he tried to grab uh, my partner's gun. So we charge him. And wouldn't you know, there was a woman there with a cell phone. And she videotaped it from quite a distance. But you could see the light was on on my flashlights. You could see the flashlight going up and down. So she, that got turned over. And then because of my name, this thing just blew up. Could you have tased him in that? Or would there not have been enough time? We didn't have tasers then. There was no tasers? No, tasers. no body cams? No body cams. So Mace wouldn't have helped. He had a hoodie. He had a hoodie on. Did you consider going for your gun at all? Or, Absolutely. But you thought in that moment, I let thought me grab that them. I was in close quarters. Now, in my mind, based on what my partner told me, you can use deadly force. Yeah. He's grabbing his gun. If he's going to get his gun, I could. I very well could have stepped back, fired two shots into him, and that's it. Well, See I think what, that's interesting to listen to too, because there are scenarios that we know, even though yours didn't end up good either yeah. there are scenarios where the officer goes straight to the gun and there's all these incidents where they shoot someone yeah. an, an, an un, unarmed person and you you held that with was restraint it obviously wouldn't have been the yeah. right thing to do but you you went to the flashlight I went, I went right to the flashlight it worked so we got him to the hospital and then we found out about the video a couple of days later and then that that changed my life once that happened did he need to be if hit, looking back on it now? Did he need to be hit all those times? Could it have been avoided? Could you have only hit him once? Did you even need to use the flashlight in that instance? I don't think I thought about it like that because the only time we gained control of him is when I hit him the last time. So I probably hit him in the shoulder, in the arm, still fighting. Uh, and even the time that I hit him in the face, I wasn't aiming at his face. He had a hood up over his head. I'm just swinging over the top. But at some point, you just felt him go limber when I hit him. A lot of times I hit the cruiser. They actually brought the cruiser hood into the courtroom to show all the dents from the light that missed him. And he was unarmed. He was unarmed, yeah. He you had, thought he had the gun. I he, thought he had the gun on my partner or was grabbing the gun on my partner, but he himself was unarmed, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's, he went to jail, the videotape came out, and... Uh, that implodes your life. That changed it. What ha do you get fired right away? What exactly? No, nope, no. Nope. Uh, I went back to work for about three weeks, th and then a lot of stress from this incident. And plus everything that I've already been through in the past. I mean, I'm walking a fine line of PTSD, stress. So I go out on stress. And uh, while I'm out, probably about a year and a half passes, I hear they're, they are charging me. Um, with assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon, flashlight, assault and battery, misdemeanor, um, and, you know, then I was headed for trial after that. How are you notified? Do they show up at your house or do they get, because yeah. you're a fellow, are they arrest you, they raid no, your house? No, they or? never did that in mm -hmm. my case. They, the cops themselves came to my house, took my gun and my badge. And you're, this is while you're on leave? Yep. So you were on leave for a whole year and a half? Yeah. And this is a paid leave? Nope. Oh, you were unpaid for unpaid. that time. Yeah, wow. I, I was able for the actually for the first half of it, I was able to collect uh, my vacation money. Mm -hmm. So I have a certain amount of vacations I can use. Once those vacations, four or five weeks, were used, I exhausted my funds. So who shows up at your house the day you're, you get arrested and charged? Uh, a captain, actually two captains, and uh, they're like, "We need your badge and gun." And one of the captains. You know, I hadn't gotten along with it for a while, so I just walked up. I just fired the ID in the car. You know, I gave the gun to the other one, and I just fired the badge in the car. I said, take him and get out of here. And I just walked away. They whipped, turned around and left. They didn't put you in cuffs or anything? Nothing. Nothing. Did just... they give you paperwork saying you're charged? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, so they didn't haul you to the courtroom or no, anything? No, which was good. I mean, in retrospect, I didn't... Was that, that didn't because happen. you're a cop? Was that like special privileges? Probably. Wow. Probably. Because yeah. the average person would not, they okay. would have been hauled well, to the cop. They know? didn't even process me. There was no processing, nothing. It all led up to the trial. And then when the trial happened, you know, obviously it was a whole other, whole other story. Was there a plea deal at all offered to you? Like, what are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Well, I should say this before I get into the court stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever did anything wrong. I, to this day, I have no regrets. I, I, I learned that there was a lot that I learned while I was in jail, a lot of experience that in jail, which changed me. But uh, I never thought I did anything wrong. So I was like, this is going to come out of trial. We're going to talk about this guy's history and grabbing the gun. It was all well documented. The, the video itself did not veer that much from the report. It didn't. Um, so I thought we're going to be fine. And uh, nope, nope. 
So there was no plea deal? No plea deal. And I thought there would be because now they have a veteran court. So I was a veteran also. And I obviously have never been involved in anything. I'm a cop. Yeah. No record, no anything. Are they going to come? Nothing. What I mean, are your colleagues saying? I wouldn't you? have taken the deal, though, to be honest with you. Because you, you felt that you were innocent. I felt that, yeah. There's no, I'm not taking a deal. What are no your way. colleagues saying to you? They feel terrible. But they're like, Jeff, the, you know, Mike wrote a good report. You guys are all set. I mean, what are we worried about here? But I said, listen, man, I'm not worried about the report. My name. I mean, the public's probably smearing you they as a... They know me. Yeah. 15 years. They think I'm nuts. Yeah. And this is... Finally, they think they're going to get their piece of me. This is... Uh, this is just a buildup of the media frenzy, the, the monster that the media created all these years. It's now going to catch up to me mm -hmm. during this. Because once I get in the courtroom, do you think any of those jurors are not going to know who I am? Yeah. They all know. They knew the second I walked in there. How are you being labeled in the media after this last incident? Awful. Awful. I mean, the, the stuff they wrote about me, I mean, I got death threats, uh, uh, Every day, it's, you know, mail showing up at the house, I'll kill you and your family, uh, phone calls during the night. And then um, one day, I'm in the house with my wife, and we get a phone call, and this is before the trial and all that. And a guy says, hey, man, he says, I'm going to kill you and your, your fucking family. And I said, oh, real, telephone tough guy. What are you going to do? He says, I'm on your front lawn. I look out, there's a guy with a gun standing on my front lawn. So I grabbed my gun. This was before they took it from me. Ran out, chased them down the street. My wife had called the East Long Meadow Police Department, which is a small town I live in just outside of Springfield. And uh, I chased the guy into the woods and in the, he lost, he took off. So we weren't able to find him, me and the East Long Meadow cops. But the phone number that he called, they were able to trace it. And it came back to a burner phone in the Mason Square area, which is where this incident happened. They went to the door and everybody there. We don't know who called. You know, it was a burner phone. There's no way you can trace it to who called. Mm -hmm. But that was that was a scary thing. How was your mental health? Were you contemplating suicide at all? I put on probably 100 pounds. Um, there were many times I thought like that. Uh, I, you know, I'm too much of a coward to do that anyways. And, and you know what? Part of me, when things got bad, I would go back to kind of that marine mentality, which is don't do this to yourself. You can get through this. You can make it. Uh, but that only helps so much. I, I ballooned up to about 270 pounds. I mean, I was, I was big. And yeah. uh, I was depressed. And uh, I was on meds. And, you know, I'm, I'm contemplating the worst coming out of this. And uh, it did. How much time were you facing going into trial? Did you know what, like, what, what, what would the worst case scenario could be if you were found guilty? Uh, five to seven years. Okay. Maybe. Uh, I mean, it's a salt battery dangerous weapon. You know, nobody died. Um, but, you know, I stuck by my story. But I ended up getting, after everything happened, uh, two and a half, 18 months direct. Do you think you never would have been charged if you didn't have those two prior incidents in your file? I don't know that, but like I said, the media and my own department not sticking up for me are the two reasons that I ended up where I ended up. No. And the sense of betrayal uh, from my job was just just awful. What was it like to be on like the other end of the spectrum? Like I'm sure as a cop, you saw a lot of individuals go to court. Maybe you had to testify at court. What was it like to be a defendant in a criminal court fighting for your life? Embarrassed. I was embarrassed. Even though I know I didn't do anything wrong, I was still very embarrassed. It was very hard for me to comprehend how far I had fallen. Even though I didn't think I did anything wrong, I'm in court. People are behind me. I'm the one being charged. You know, they know I was a police officer. And uh, because of the way it was reported, everybody thought I was wrong anyways. Did you testify in your case? I did. Do you think that hurt you or? I don't think it hurt me. No, I think that the... Jury knew me very well before I ever stepped on that stand. And my own department screwed me during that trial badly. badly. And how, how would you say they screwed you? There was a lieutenant on scene that I told you earlier. A lieutenant. Mm -hmm. He was the one who initially stopped the car. He's the one who initially started a fight with this guy. And he wrote a report you know, backing us up that uh, he submitted to the police commissioner. Police commissioner made him rewrite the report four times until it got down to, I didn't see anything. Even though on video, he's standing right there over my shoulder. Yeah. Now, during court, 
I wanted him subpoenaed. He disappeared to Canada for an alleged hockey tournament. Never testified for me. Real coward, this guy. You know, I still see him once in a while. Coward. The same with the commissioner then. He's a coward too. How long was the trial? The trial was probably a week. Oh, okay, it was, it was a week-long you know, trial. It was about a week-long trial. How long did it take for them to reach a verdict? Um, I think I had to go back maybe about four days. It took them four days to reach a verdict. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and then when they came back, I'm there with my father-in-law and my wife and my father, and I, I took my watch off, and I gave it to my father. I gave my car keys to my wife. And they're like, what are you doing? You're probably just going to get probation. You know, you should be all right. We think everything's going to be good. I said, I got a bad feeling. This is before the verdict even came before, back? Yeah. No, this was after that. So this was the sentencing portion. Okay. So, so the verdict had already come back. Verdict came back guilty. guilty. How did you feel when you got that guilty verdict read to you? Awful. Your heart like um, saying. Yeah. Mm. And I heard my all the cops that, that were there to support me. There must have been fifty of them in there. And I could just hear the, the gasps. You know, I don't think they could believe it. Mm. And they knew what happened. They knew the commissioner threw me under the bus. They knew the lieutenant threw me under the bus. And they also knew the captain of the detective bureau threw me under the bus early on. Not to veer off too much, but the woman who drove the car that night got arrested in East Long Meadow for shoplifting. So she talked to the East Middle Cop. She says, hey, you know this guy Asher in Springfield's in trouble? Yeah, we know him. They said, uh, she said, I want to talk to the Springfield police. So a couple cops go out there and she says, hey, I just want to let you know that before you guys walked up to the car that night, he was telling me he's going to run. If he's got a fight, he's gone. And uh, she said, I'd love to, to testify for him if I could to get out of my charges. So they brought that back to this captain in the detective bureau. Right in the trash. Got rid of it. Yeah. That's how corrupt it is. And how did you find out all this information? Well, one of my buddies was the sergeant that brought that information to the captain. Um, there were other people in the DB that saw the report keep getting thrown out and rewritten by this lieutenant. So I had friends that were still there, um, but they were actively trying to, to screw me. I mean, they were making it their life's mission to go after me. So, um, you know, there's there's a list of guys that that really made my life hell. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine, man. Uh, I mean, you served the country, you served the the police force, and then just yeah. all of this. This is how it yeah. ends. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I was, uh, <clears throat> you know, I I have a good personality. I get along with everybody on the job. I had never done anything to any of these guys. It's easier for them at that point in our careers for them to cut me loose, watch me go to jail, than to actually defend me. Because you know, cops nowadays, the job has changed. The defund the police movement, Black Lives Matter, things have changed a lot. Um, cops now have cameras on their chest and they're not, they almost have to act like robots now because they're playing to either the camera here or the camera from the person. So you've got to make a decision, a split second decision now knowing you're on film. But don't you think that holds the bad ones accountable? Because there, there are bad ones. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yep. It'll do that. I mean, it's actually, I like the cameras on the cops because you're right. The bad ones are going to do bad stuff and get caught anyways. And the good ones, the video is going to help clear them from what they did. Um, but a video can be read so many different ways. Yeah. Being a Monday morning they quarterback. They can cut it. Yeah. Yeah. You can look back and uh, on a video and play Monday morning quarterback. I've got three seconds to decide if this guy's got a gun and I'm here in gun. I'm not waiting five to seven seconds. I'm not waiting a minute to find out if I'm going to get shot. Yeah. He's getting hit. No, it's, it. it's so tough, especially with social media. Like, I, I hope one day there could be like a fair, you know, balance, you know, yeah. just a, a just balance. I mean, look what they do with the clips. I was watching the whole McConnell thing with him. Yeah, and freezing up. It's just all the clips of just him frozen there that probably got expanded a little bit oh, and sure. made to be, you know, everything. Yeah. It's just, it's how it's portrayed. You always see that. You yeah. don't see the lead up or the after. You just see that one moment. Yeah. Like every time Biden trips, <laughs> they, they, they extend that out. I don't know. It's just, it's crazy. And there's definitely like, it's not like all cops aren't bad, but all cops aren't also good. Oh, and, yeah. and there's just like that fine line of, and the gray area in it. I think that's what bothered me the most was I never, I was never a bad cop, 
But because of these incidents, the newspaper turned me in to what they thought was a bad cop. Yeah. They created a monster for the people of Springfield. Actually, I mean, it was most of these were nationwide things, but Springfield, so everybody that saw me everywhere I went was, hey, that's the cop. That's the cop that beats everybody up. That's the cop that's in the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, that was the type of stuff that was out there. So I never had a chance by the time we got to that last incident to really have a fair trial. To, it, at that point, between the newspaper and the betrayal from my bosses, I was cooked. So sentencing day happens. You give your wife, your family, the watch, the cards, the keys, because you have a bad feeling. Yeah. What happens? I thought in my mind, they're going to send me to jail. But I'm thinking six months, a year. I didn't know, but I'm thinking, geez, I don't have a record. None of that stuff, but no. You served in the military. I served in the military, mm -hmm. and the judge said, uh, I'm giving you two and a half years, 18 months direct, uh, sending you to Franklin County Corrections in uh, Northern Mass. And, uh, and that was it. And then the jail guards got up, and I was waiting for them to cuff me, and they didn't. And the judge said, cuff him, please. And they looked at her and said, nope. These are guys I knew. Wow. They walked me to the elevator to go down, and they would not put the cuffs on. So you never got handcuffed? Never. I mean, I did downstairs. Once I got in the prison, <laughs> yeah, I did. But I, had, I looked like Hannibal Lecter in the So band. they shackled you? They show you. Yeah, How did it feel me. to get shackled as a cop, like for the first time? It was awful. I mean, I don't know how to describe it. Are you thinking how, like, defendants feel now yeah. at this point yeah. like does it make you think about the people that you arrested and how oh they God, felt yeah. like it puts it into perspective yeah. how the mighty have fallen and what about did they strip search you for that first time yeah how does that feel to 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 go through that whole process embarrassing um humiliating uh, my lawyer had come downstairs and he took you couldn't go with your tie you had to take your tie off you know hanging yourself they took the tie and um he gave me a hundred dollar bill. He said, when you get there, put this in your commissary so you can buy some stuff. He could give you cash? He gave me cash. I put, what, this is crazy. But here's the wild part. I put the cash in my pocket. And then when I got to jail, they put it all in property. So I got that hundred back when I left. Uh -huh. So I wasn't able to get any commissary till it opened up for people to start putting it in. So that hundred was nice. I had that hundred right when I got out, but yeah, nice little yeah, something. Yeah. So you're a former cop that goes to a Massachusetts state prison, right? What's that like? County are, jail. County, jail. county jail. Yeah. How are you treated? Are they, do you go in general pop? Do you go in, in the shoe, in the hole? What happens? Uh, I was in a protective cell the first probably uh, seven, eight days, which they only bring you out for one hour. You take a shower in a little metal box. You know, they give you soap and something else. It's, it's toothpaste, that's it. Um, but they kept me in. It was, a small, it was a cell block. It had two doors, one for another prisoner, who was there for a dangerousness hearing, and then me. It was 23 and one for a week uh, with minimal phone contact. And of course, all I'm thinking about is my wife, my son, uh, my daughter. And uh, it's, it was terrible. It was terrible. I mean, just- You have to be going crazy too. I remember the first time I'm put in a box like that, you, you get like claustrophobic and yeah. you're just, you're losing all, cause you lose your freedom. Plus you're depressed. I was depressed. My PTSD was kicking in. Uh, you know, I didn't know what to do, but the guy next to me, you know, of course you're right next to each other. He had no one to talk to before I got there. So we start talking and I found out, he said, oh, I used to be a great candle pin bowler. And I was on this show in the, in the eighties. I was a kind of a championship candle pin bowler. And I said, you know, what are you here for? And he says, I had drugs. He said, and I said, and he said, domestic stuff. He said, they're keeping me for 90 days. I only got 11 days left. So I said, best of luck when you get out. He goes, I'm on the straight and narrow now. I'm going to go to casino. I'm going to go to Mohegan. I'm done, you know, I'm done using drugs. Um, I got a letter from him when I finally got over to APOD and started getting into the, the serious guys. I got a letter. And he said, I just want to let you know I'm doing great. I went to the casino. Everything's fine. And then four days later, a sergeant come up to me and says, hey, you remember the guy you were in with in the, in the holding block? I said, yeah. He said, he OD'd yesterday. Oh, wow. He was in Holyoke, Mass. He had probably taken what he was used to taking when he first went in. Yeah. And, uh, and he died. And I still have that letter in my house. Yeah. That guy. Pretty wild. Yeah, I'm sure you see a lot of that in oh. general, like as a cop, uh, seeing oh, yeah. uh, defendants, you know, re-go through the system and everything. Yeah, yeah. Now, you're putting a general population. How are the inmates treating you as a cop? 
One of the first things the guard told me was, uh, don't let anyone step into your cell. Whatever you do, that's your space. Nobody else comes in. Day one, hour one, big black guy comes up to the door. Hey man, how you doing? Can I help you out? Do you need anything? And all of a sudden there's one step, two step. And those cells aren't big. And I knew what was coming. And because I looked behind him, and I saw a guy kind of peeking in the door like this, and I'm like, I'm gonna get jumped. So he came up, he's like, nice to meet you. As soon as he stuck his hand out, I swung as hard as I could. And I caught him right on the chin, and I leapt on him, and I just started hitting him as hard as I could. And within minutes, the COs were there, they broke it up, and uh, that was it for that guy giving me problems. They left you in the unit after that? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So are the COs looking out after you because you're like a fellow officer? Not really. They some of them were great, don't get me wrong. There were some guys that uh, they knew, my brother-in-law who's a chief probation officer in Massachusetts, they knew people I knew, they knew cops I knew. There were some very good guys, but there were some guys that, hey man. They're telling inmates he's yeah, a cop. He's a cop. They all knew, a lot of them knew, but they told everybody. How does an inmate view a cop in prison? Like a pedophile. Like a pet, it's just as bad. Just above. No matter, regardless whether you're a good cop or anything, you're labeled as a pedophile. You gotta remember, these guys look at you like you're the cop that locked them up, right? You are the cop that put all them guys, even though I'm not the cop that arrested this guy, this guy, this guy. You're a cop in jail, you locked me up. Your people, your tribe, you locked me up. So right away, man, everyone there hates you. Everyone there hates you. I couldn't avoid trouble. Anywhere I went in there, don't touch the remote. You can't go in that shower. You can't sit at that table. Which is exactly how sex offenders are treated. Yep. In federal prison, yep. I didn't really run into any cops because yep. the, you don't really see too many in the federal system. You see more in, in like the county and whatnot. And it wasn't just the black inmates, you know, because it was that whole connection with the, with the race, with the yeah. race stuff. This guy with a swastika on his head, WP on his arm for white power. I sit at a table that was quiet to eat my first meal, and he looks at me, and says, "Man, you got to get the fuck off this table." And I just sat there and ate slow, and I would just look at him every once in a while and just eat because I'm like, "Fuck this guy." You're not gonna scare me. You wanna fight, we'll fight. I don't mind fighting. I don't wanna fight, but I'm not gonna be punked while we're in here either. You may kick my ass, but, but you know, I'll get my, I'll get my licks in, you know? So I, had, I sat there and did it, and it worked. He never said anything after. He said a couple of times. So, so you're a fighter in prison? I did a few times. I, I'm happy to say it was no more than three or four times. There you were, were there a, to survive. A lot of verbal altercations. I certainly wasn't a tough guy. A lot of guys in there are a lot tougher than me. Um, but I spent my career fighting people. So I know how to hang on. You know, I know how to, to get through it if I have to. Do they give you a nickname at all? Uh, Smasher. Smasher. <laughs> that was your name. Yeah. Did you make friends at all in there? Like, were guys nice to you? Were, was there anyone nice to you? Well, after these altercations, uh, word got back through my wife to the Hampton County Sheriff, because I was his prisoner. Even though I was in another county, they put me up there to keep me away from the Springfield guys. Yeah. So once my sheriff got news, he's like, what the hell's he doing in General Pop and Pod A with pre-trial prisoners? Some of them have killed their wives and killed people. You got him in there with him? So they made a quick decision, hey, he's got to go to minimum security. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of shitheads in minimum security, but that's where we're going to put you. So they brought me over to minimum, and uh, I would say it was a lot better. It's still jail. You still ain't going anywhere, but uh, it was a little looser, a little bit looser than, uh, than being in general. Public. You were treated better? Yeah. For the most part, by the inmates at least. Uh, that started off rough too. The first day, they give because they give you a new color uniform now. So it was orange in APOD, but it's yellow minimum security. So the, this female guard calls me and she says, here you go, three shirts, three pairs of pants. And uh, I put those on the table right behind me. She gave me a couple other things. When I turned around, a shirt and pair of pants were missing. And this white guy, his name was Ron. I saw he's sitting there smiling and he had the shit in front of him. So I'm like, oh boy, here we go. So... About two hours later, and again, I did the complete opposite of what that guy did stepping in my cell. I found out where his cell was, and I walked right in, grabbed my stuff and walked out. He goes, yo, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking my fucking shit back. That's it. That's it. What's funny is I gained his respect because I ended up doing outside details with him, painting houses and stuff. He talked to me the rest of the time I was there. He was nuts. He was crazy. He was doing life in installments. 
he'll do two years here, three years here, two years there. He probably, in, in the end, he probably does over 20 years. Wow. Just broken up in county time. Yeah. But uh, he became friends with him. I mean, you know what I compare this to is I'll hear stories from some tough prisons about how like a sex offender or a choma would stand up for themselves and fight back yeah. and no one fucks with them at that point. That's all it is. Yeah. You know, that's all it is. But it, um, at some point about, I want to say about six months in, um, I go into an AA class because they had classes you could take to earn good time. So I go into an AA class and I said halfway through the AA class, I says, uh, hey, excuse me for a minute. I said, I'm not an alcoholic. And I said, I feel bad listening to these guys tell their stories, but I don't think it's fair for me to be here as somebody that's not an alcoholic listening to their stories. I shouldn't be here. She goes, well, you're going to stay. And I said, I'll stay. Nope. If these guys don't have a problem, if these other inmates have a problem with it, I'll stay. But, you know, wh why should they tell their stories in front of somebody who doesn't have a problem no. with drinking alcohol? She took offense to that. And I didn't know it at the time, this caseworker. And uh, about a week later, I'm in my cell. It's a Sunday morning and visiting coming. And I was always important. You know, it was visiting day. My wife was coming up with the kids. And all of a sudden, I know I get pushed up against the wall, cuffed, and thrown in the hole. I'm like, what did I do? Yo, oh, you insulted a caseworker. You yelled at a caseworker. I'm like, I didn't yell at a caseworker. I, asked, I told them a story about the alcohol and anonymous. They bring me the hole, and I did about eight days in the hole, which was insane. Eight days. I don't care if in the hole for three days. It sucks. Hey, I did three months, man. Yeah, it's off. <laughs> it's off. You know, the screaming and the all night long. And there was a guy next to me. And for three straight days, almost, I mean, it must have been six, seven hours a day, he would just scream out, I got the moves like Jagger. I got the moves like Jagger. That song, that's all he would scream for hours and hours. I mean, I wanted to kill myself. I'm like, this is... I was able to finally make a phone call and get a hold of my wife. And she called uh, the sheriffs at the time and said, they've got him in the hole. Some caseworker, they told him what happened. And uh, right before that happened, this kid came up to my cell and he says, hey, I'm part of the Sycamore Street Posse in Springfield. I says, yeah, so who gives a shit? He goes, when I get out of here, I'm going to fuck you up. I'm going to fuck your family up. I'm like, all right, whatever. Next thing you know, a guard comes up and says, hey, I'm going to let you out with this guy. You're going to clean the cell block. So I looked at him. I go, as soon as you open that door, I'm going after him. And he's like, what? And I said, I'm going to fuck him up. He just came over and threatened me. He even made reference to a cop murder. This Kevin Ambrose was, a, was an awesome cop on our job. He was killed in the line of duty. He said, I'm going to put one in your head like Ambrose got in his head. So my PTSD, my stress, I mean, I was as red as you could get. If that cell door opened, I was going to kill this guy. I mean, really, it, you threaten my family, you bring up Kevin's name, it's on. Um, and then the next thing I know, they lock him back in his cell. They come down, they cuff me up. They walk me out of the hole. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm done. I got to be going to the sheriff. They brought me to a closet, said change into that yellow outfit, which is minimum security. Okay, here's your bag. Ramen noodles and all the other stuff, you know, the, yeah. all the stuff they... Yeah. They walked me back to minimum. And I remember the guard saying to me while I'm walking up the steps, he goes, Jeff, he goes, I can't believe the two things I just saw this week. And I said, what? He goes, number one, I've never seen anybody go from the hole back to minimum security. You're supposed to go back through the pods, kind of earn your way back to minimum. Yeah. He goes, I've never seen that. He goes, number two, all 12 of the inmates that you were in that class with wrote statements supporting you and not the caseworker. And I'm like, are you kidding me? He goes, no, all of them. Latin kings, domestic abusers, you know, you name it. Whatever they had been in there for. They all stuck up for me. Yeah, and Because I had came built together. such a relationship with them while I was there with them, listened to them, talked to them, that they, they paid me back by doing that, which I thought was awesome. That's great. Yeah. How long do you end up doing? I, I was reading somewhere that you got out earlier than expected to. Yeah, yeah, about 10 months. So you did 10 months? Yeah. How hard was it to reintegrate back into society after that? Now, late with this label on you, you're in the public eye, you're out of jail, which you never thought you would be in in yeah. your life. How's it, how is life? Well, uh, when I came home, I was on parole and I was on the bracelet. Um, so I had the bracelet on my ankle. And it was the winter, which was great because I could just wear my sweats and nobody saw the thing. Anyways. Yeah, I wore my sweats and long socks right. at the gym all the time. Yeah, right. So nobody saw it. I had to... Uh, 
I had to write a schedule. If, you know, if I want to go to the movies, go to the grocery store, they had to know the times I was going. I didn't find it hard to get back into stuff. I, I was, to me, the best reward I got was the looking at these prisoners in a different way than I ever looked at them as a cop. They all had a story. It was, there was a way that all these guys ended up where they ended up. And uh, I appreciated listening to their stories. You know, you get the guys, the cops did it to me and the cops framed me. And I, but I got to know their individual stories and I'd never met, talked to people like that firsthand. And it, to me, I got a lot of satisfaction on when I left there, them hugging me, you know, them wanting to stay together um, and, uh, and meet up with me in the future and talk and stuff like that. It was, it was, it was very rewarding. You see the totally different perspective than what you're used to. Yeah. Like the opposite of what your whole life was, yeah. military, police, and yeah. you go and see that. The only normal guy I had was my next door neighbor, my cellmate next door. He robbed 25 million from his brother, 25 million. So I said, what are you doing in a county jail? 25 million, I mean, that's like, you ought to be in federal lockup or state. He goes, uh, he goes uh, I was a jail guard at Walpole in Massachusetts. And he said, because I was a jail guard there, they can't put me in a state facility, so they tucked me in out here. So I'm like, who's your brother? He's like, Dane Cook. You know Dane Cook, yeah, the actor and comedian. Yeah. It's his brother, Daryl. Didn't he steal from his own brother? Yeah. I, that's wild yeah. that you were with him. I was with him, he was a great guy. Wow, I was reading that whole article. This was a few years ago. Yeah. Because he, and yeah. his brother didn't rat him out though, right? I think someone else. Yeah, well the wife too. Uh, the guy I was with, his wife stole some of the money too, opened up businesses in like a gunkwood, Maine, selling seashells. What a small and world. But he ended up in the, in the next cell. He also wrote jokes for his brother. Yeah. So I'd play basketball with him every night and he had a great sense of humor. He graduated from Northeastern in Boston. He was a guy that I could talk to more than anybody because he was, I love talking to the other guys, but he was smart like me. He had college time. And, well, and he had law enforcement background. He had law enforcement background of being a jail guard. Yeah. And, uh, That's good that you got to find someone to like have that comfort in. I still talk to him. Did you get to, you know, see any mental health treatment when you got out and really work on? Yeah. I mean, to this day, I, I still go to the VA. Uh, I'm 100% disabled um, through the VA. So I go there probably once a month, talk to somebody. Um, but I've been doing a lot better. So you didn't end up going into work when you got out of prison? No, because I'm 100% disabled vet at that point. Yeah. You can't work. Uh, I can make a certain amount of years, so I do work for UPS every winter, no. uh, which is great money in about a three-month span. Um, and I'm working with a lot of other retired cops and troopers, Mass State troopers. They love doing that work. That's great. Yeah, so that's it. My, wife's, my wife works. Um, what know. do your kids think of this whole situation? Are they old enough to comprehend it? Oh, yeah, my point? son's 21. Okay. My daughter's 20. Um, what do you do? You have a, like a sit down conversation with them, especially with like with tensions in America right now and the way things happen. Yeah, my son wanted was talking about becoming a cop. I'm like, nope, you're not doing it. Yeah. No way, no way. It's not the same job as it was when we first came on, and it, it it will never be again. I had a lot of fun my first couple of years. Loved it. No more. Yeah. You know. Wow. And what do you say to the individuals? that might put you in the same category as other officers that have might have abused the badge or were put in the public eye and you could very well be put into that category oh, yeah. what, what do you say to them there's almost a, a lot of them you can't argue with because if they think you're wrong you're wrong it doesn't i could tell them all day long about the gun and the, this and the knife under this guy it doesn't matter they don't like people don't like to see brute force People don't like to see billy clubs. They don't like to see flashlights. So anything that involves brute force, they want nothing to do with it. Uh, it's, I think it's easier if they see somebody shot once. You know, did the guy turn? Was it a legit reason to shoot? It's cut and dry. You know, the cop was wrong. The guy didn't have a gun. He's wrong. Or yes, he had a gun. The cop was right. When it comes to hitting somebody, that's the stuff that people get nervous about. They don't like to see that. So... I don't care how anybody looks at me these days. I'm a happy guy. You know, I, I, I moved on. I work for a nonprofit now uh, for first responders um, that I get a lot of satisfaction out of. And I get to work with some of the cops I used to work with doing it. And now what's your message? Like, what do you want people to take away from your story? They listen, they hear this. What do you want those takeaways to be? What do you want someone to get inspired about hearing and listening to your story? 
Well, I mean, you can't let failure determine the rest of your life. You can't. Uh, even though I don't think I did anything wrong, I still took a nosedive off the map because of the news and everything else. Uh, I think that you just have to rise above, uh, restart your life, uh, you know, pick a plan, and, uh, and stick to it. I, again, I, I'm a personable guy, so I can jump into anything easy. Um, but, you know, don't give up. Don't, uh, don't let one moment in your life, right or wrong, define your future. Well said. Jeff, thanks for coming on the show yeah, today, Ian, man. I loved it, man. Yeah, great conversation with you. Chest, yep. Yeah, I, I think you're definitely one of the people that we have back for a part two one day just to hear like all the, you were on the force for, you know, 15, 16 years. Yeah. I'm sure you got stories for days, man. Hey, I'd love to. Even you and Chicky sitting here going at each other, man. I got to call up Chicky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's was, right. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That's right. I'll but do it. Thank you, Jeff. I, yeah, you know, you. I, I wish you the best, man, and everything. And, Thanks. you know, keep hanging in there and keep doing you. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. I appreciate it.